welcome to our weekly lives here at the Clean Health page. I'm your master coach, Maria Barova and WBFF Pro. Today, I'm going to have Astrid join our live and we're gonna be talking about nutrition considerations specifically for women. Um, like always, if you have any questions, please make sure you put it in that question box so that I can bring that question um, up on the screen so everyone can see. Um, but other than that, we have some questions we're gonna be going over some topics um, and we're just gonna wait for Astrid to join us. Hello everybody, thank you so much for joining. I hope everybody is doing well. Astrid is about to join us any moment now and we can get started. Hi Astrid. Hello, how are you? I am doing well. I'm super excited to have our live today. We're gonna be talking about nutrition considerations specifically for women. So I'm excited. I do work predominantly with a lot of women and I know that specifically when it comes to nutrition, women can find a lot of struggle with it. So I hope that we're able to answer a lot of questions for everybody and I'm excited to get started. Let's do it. All right, we're just gonna kick it off. So we're gonna start off by talking about the three main mistakes women make when it comes to their nutrition. So what are the three you're most familiar with or see often in your practice? Number one is women trying to diet all year round because they think they need to be in a calorie deficit all day, every day, every single day. And that is really, really harmful for the metabolic rate, the progress, the relationship with food. The second, the second thing is not eating enough protein or not feeling like they, it is, it's, it's just like something that I see commonly happening all over and over. Every time I assess uh, my clients' diets, they're not eating enough protein. Yeah. And generally, they struggle to meet or even get over 100 grams of protein. So that is a, a, a number, th and number two. And number three, I think it is about being fearful, fearful of resistance training yes. or getting too bulky. And this is so often... Mm, miscon like there is a huge misconception around training heavy or actually trying to be very consistent with exercise and resistance training and always thinking that you need to be doing cardio a lot to lose body weight or lose body fat and it is not necessarily true and in fact you have to find a really nice balance between how much cardio is too much what is too little whether you actually need to use cardio uh, at some point or certain stages uh, in your fat loss phase and how much is too much of that resistance training. So it's just finding that happy medium for each person. And obviously for each woman, it's going to be different depending on how lean they are, if they have any injuries, uh, the history of like the relationship with their cardio and training and like, it's just, like, complicated, and as it always it depends, but it is going to be these three main things that I see often happening amongst women that could definitely improve if they had yeah. more awareness on that. Yeah, and I think a lot of that comes, you know, with generations of, you know, years of constantly being embedded in the heads of women that they need to be a certain size, as being as small as they can be or eating as little as they can be. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but like growing up hearing things like a minute on the lips is a lifetime on the hips or something like, you know, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. And these types of behaviors that we're taught from a very young age create such this distorted perception on nutrition. And you see it with all ages of women uh, struggling to accept that you know eating more food is going to help you get to that goal that you've set for yourself and overall body health and uh, wellness and, and it's it's one of the most predominant issues and most of the client women clients that I work with come to me eating drastically low calories and are afraid when we do things like reverse diets and things like that which we will talk a little bit more about later in our life um, so what would you say if there is a difference when it comes to eating between men and women are there, should there be differences? Are there any recommended differences when it comes to just simple eating or eating behaviors? In terms of the type of foods or like eating generally, like the diet on its own, there is no, no difference. Yeah. The only difference obviously will come down to 
the size yeah. because, well, generally speaking, women will be smaller than men. It doesn't necessarily need to be that way because there are women that are larger than other men. Yeah. But overall, we see that perhaps the quantities are going to be potentially smaller for women, uh, portion sizes overall, just because the size of women are smaller, they have lean, less lean body mass, and potentially that's where some of the difference in terms of the diet on its own would vary. Yeah. But when we think about protein, recommendations are going to be exactly the same. There's nothing that you will, like, which I would say that is going to be a, a huge difference. In fact, I, I really am a good advocate to increase protein intake in women. Yeah. And that 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight still stands for women and men. So I don't think that has to change very much. And when we think about carbohydrates and, pro, um, and fats, it's going to come down to energy, total energy expenditure, physical activity, metabolic health, and generally the preference of each person. Like some women will prefer or will do better at lower carbohydrates yeah. other women will do better with higher carbohydrates and remember not all carbohydrates are equal yeah so when we think about that we want to think about high high fiber whole grain nutritious carbohydrates being present in your diet what that contain higher fiber intake higher fiber content overall and that's where we look at vegetables yep we look at five of, um, fruit overall and also looking at not demonizing yeah. soul foods because there's some, there is a place for highly processed food or highly palatable foods within a healthy diet yeah. is more about frequency and quantity that we want to maybe yeah. consider how often do we have these things, how much. And overall, in the context of a healthy diet, that should still be fine. Yeah, I, I don't, I want to hear your opinion on this as well with when it comes to like eating behaviors. Um, I think uh, based off of just my experiences, and you can share yours, I feel as though women tend to be drawn more towards emotional eating. And then also like emotionally fearing a lot of like, food groups, like whole food groups, like protein, because they don't want to get bulky or carbs, because they don't want to put on weight. And that kind of puts me into that next question about, you know, does each macronutrient, what, what is more effective when especially when it comes to weight loss, because we have a lot of women really wanting to do that. And when it comes outside of protein, you know, does carbon fat ratios, do those matter, right? How does that play a role into that eating behavior, specifically when it go, comes to weight loss? And fat loss. That it, well, there is not a huge difference. Um, it will come down to maybe the thermic effect of food. Mm -hmm. And we know that carbohydrates are slightly higher in that thermic effect versus when we compare that to uh, fat. But when we actually look a little bit deeper into the carbohydrates, the, again, not all carbohydrates are equal. So the high fiber carbohydrates will have a higher thermic effect of food. So actually fiber and protein are kind of hand to hand yeah. there in that 30% of the TEF versus like carbohydrates would be about eight to 10% yeah. and fats would be around five to 6% of that TEF. So really it comes down to energy balance at the end of the day. Yeah. It is more being and finding what is sustainable for a healthy diet yeah. Generally speaking, we want to aim for a higher protein diet with the higher TEF, higher fiber as well that may promote a, a little bit of a, a larger deficit, but it's still, when we look at the big picture, the TEF versus the other, other components of that energy expenditure equation are going to just to be around 10%, 10 to 10 12% of the total energy expenditure. So it's not like a huge thing. It may add, obviously, day to day to day to day, it adds up a little bit. So that is kind of where we want to see the big picture in terms of the body composition, 
uh, changes, but at the same time, it's not like a, the end of the world if yeah. you have more carbs or more fats. Basically, it comes back down to adherence and what is sustainable for that particular person. Yeah, and when we're talking about adherence, I think the biggest thing that we see is, you know, these drastic approaches to, and we're going to, I'm talking specifically about weight loss, because that is a very common goal for women. But, you know, when a woman comes up to you or says they have a goal of let's tone, becoming tone, and understanding that, you know, that may require a period of time where you need to be consuming more food. How would you approach that method of increasing your food intake without necessarily triggering that fear of gaining fat, right? That's the biggest hesitation when it comes to, and we're kind of getting into like reverse dieting. There's like a big hesitation of, I don't want to eat too much because I don't want to put on weight. So how would you navigate that or recommend women to approach that uh, reverse dieting? I sit down with them and try to find what their current intake is, what the baseline is in terms of current calories, mm -hmm. protein, carbohydrates, fats, what's the current level of physical activity and training, and try to do some SMART swaps around their diet and pretty much trying to prioritize some of the macronutrients and look at, well, how much protein are you currently eating? Yeah. Let's bump that up a little bit more. Yeah. What about carbohydrates and fats? Are they in a healthy place? If they are, we're just trying to add slightly more calories week to week without feeling like it is too much. So yeah, it makes sort of a, a it, it kind of plays a role with that reverse dieting um, concept because we are trying to increase these calories slowly, but it just depends as well where the calories are currently sitting at. Yeah. If the calories are relatively sustainable, you could potentially think we might not necessarily drop your calories more for fat loss, but we could increase your energy expenditure. Let's focus on resistance training. Let's add more steps throughout the day. Let's increase your protein and fiber. And that would add up to that energy expenditure yeah. of that side of the equation without necessarily needing to drop more calories. Yeah. If the calories are really, really low, are unsustainable low, that you would put more stress on adding more restriction and cutting the calories even lower, then there is not potentially further room to increase a calorie deficit. So that's where increasing energy expenditure and perhaps just focusing on adherence yeah. might be more than enough. And I see this all the time with my clients that I just say, I, I don't want to go, I don't want to put you in a calorie deficit or like, your current calories are already low. I'm not going to drop them anymore, any further. I'm going to work on your consistency and adherence based on adding more focus on your resistance training. Let's right. really nail down your resistance training. Let's nail down your consistency with your daily steps. Yeah. What about your protein? Are you eating enough protein? Because at the majority of the times, I see that the protein intake day to day is very jumpy. Yeah. So one day it might be quite high, but another day is below 100 grams. Another day is relatively in the, t in the place where you want to see it, but it's not consistent. Yeah. So we, we want to see less jumps when we look at day to day protein intake yeah. and same with everything else. So when you nail down the consistency, then you might be able to see what else can we do if right. there's something happening that is not happening right now in terms of your fat loss but just doing these small changes you can see body composition changes yeah. without necessarily having to implement a very drastic approach yeah and i think once you start making drastic approaches whether you are you know trying to do this yourself or a coach trying to coach a woman going through this or anybody to be quite frank like you need to understand that the more drastic it is, the lower compliance is. If your calories are really low and your expenditure is really high, you're more likely not able to comply to that. And why you see, you know, maybe two, three weeks of compliance and then a drop. And it's con that's that yo-yo cycle where you're like all in 100% with a very extreme deficit. You're seeing weight loss and then life happens or you, you cave into that hunger and you start eating normal levels. But with stuff like metabolic adaptation, it's fluctuating too. And it's like all factors are against you. And it's from sourcing from that fear of like constantly undernourishing our bodies. So I think that that's one of the biggest things is assessing where you're at 
and it takes a little bit of effort and compliance to kind of really accurately see where your maintenance is before being able yeah. to decide do you have the capacity to be in a deficit if not you have to get a little uncomfortable and put yourself in a position where you're increasing your intake over time how long would an average woman let's say for example they're coming at you with a very critically low maintenance they're like a maintenance that you're like red flag all when you see and you find out the number what would a reverse dieting phase roughly be like i know it's very individual and it really depends but what would you say is like the average amount of time a woman can commit uh, to reverse dieting i would say the minimum of 16 weeks as a minimum and i could say it could last at least a year where you can actually see good changes and it depends on the speed and how much they are willing to to add in terms of daily calories and how their body is responding as well as how their mindset and their relationship with the body if they're in a good and healthy place and they're actually willing to take some risk and see some weight gain yeah. on a day to on a week to week basis because it is going to happen and i actually warned them before we actually started the reverse diet you're not going to necessarily see changes on a lower side yeah. you probably will see a little bit of a small jumps on yeah. the scale and sometimes can be very very frustrating and scary yeah. especially women that fixate their worth and the, yeah. the everything around the weight the scale weight so i think it is really important to have those clear expectations that the scale may, may play a role on your emotions and how you deal with that so that's why i think that the value of a coach especially on a reverse side is that in, important support in that approaching and assessing and interpreting the weight the scale weight yeah. and how things are changing and moving to the other side of the spectrum yep. where sometimes unconsciously even whatever approach you're implementing if you if you're not happy about your weight or your body image you want to see the scale going down yeah. not up and going up triggers a really difficult emotional yeah. i don't know it, it is just very very challenging for a lot of women yeah and i see that with you know i've experienced that with some of my clients that i put through a reverse dieting phase it's we're committed to building muscle the first couple weeks are great we're going to reverse diet build up our maintenance calories this is great until they step on the scale and then they start seeing a climb or they see that maybe a little bit of ab definition is going away and then they're like time to go into a cutting phase again right and it's that type of mentality where when you have a coach and you have that guidance they're able to you know sit you down and remind you that you know what is our ultimate goal right maybe right now our goal shouldn't be looking at the scale weight maybe it's looking at performance how are you feeling at the gym how are you feeling eating more food like tracking other things as well as the weight really does help with that behavior trigger where it's like sometimes in reverse sides i find for myself i really do find that women that are kind of iffy about the scale doing something like measurements right that they they're, they're not tied to the number on the scale but actually doing like waist measurements and stuff like that don't trigger as much as like seeing i'm up 2 pounds i have to you know i have to do extra cardio or steps The weight is literally just a number and I wish that we didn't obsess over a certain number that we have to be but unfortunately even now with even all this free education and mentorship and coaches women still obsess over this number. I hear like older women saying, "I used to be this much in high school, you know, I'm trying to get back to that." I'm like, "That was you in high school. You're a grown woman. You have muscle. You can no, no, no." So I think moral of the story is to all women watching this or coaches encourage your clients male or female to not focus on that scale weight. It's we use it as a tool like a data point. I always see it. I'm like it's just numbers to me. It has nothing like I just see it as data. No value this is not your worth. Like you are worth so much more than that scale weight. Um, And sometimes I laugh because I I I have been tracking my weight over the past few months. Uh, as I started tracking again and mm -hmm. um, getting onto uh, just a, a more approach of like looking at my at my calories yeah. and a, a starting a small fat loss phase, and it's funny because I laugh at myself every time I jump on the scale. Sometimes it, it is up to two pounds. Yeah, I'm like, 
huh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I no longer put so much stress on that because, yeah, you, so many things that affect your weight. Yes. Like, just the fact that you are pretty much like 60% made of water yeah like that will change and that will fluctuate yeah. within a day you can change your weight up until two to three pounds or even five, five pounds. pounds yeah so that can change within a day just because your water fluctuations your residue from food everything that is gastrointestinal residues whatever you are eating may affect as well yeah. like pooping like if you haven't pooped that yeah. is going to affect your weight. And there's so many different things that you can just say, well, I just gained two pounds or three pounds of fat just because one day is heavier. Yeah. And sometimes what happens, and I see this a lot, people tend to eat a slightly more in the weekends. Mm -hmm. And that is normal. Like they probably are eating, eating out or having more food over the weekend. Yeah. And they then they jump on the scale on Monday. Monday and they see their weight really, really high. And if they stick with the mindset of like, probably this is not like a real weight uh, or that reflection of what really my actual body fat is, or my yeah. weight is, and they continue to consistently weigh themselves throughout the week, they see the scale goes back to normal yeah. For three days later, after like that, yeah, peak higher calorie intake. Yeah, and I think that's why it's really important to view your weight as data points, so that you're not tied to that number and are able to, you know, weigh yourself. If you are going to weigh yourself, don't stick to just weighing yourself once and then freaking out over that number. Weigh yourself yep. over the you know course of the week and th take the average of that. That'll be a truer indication of where your weight can be and not just that one data point in the week and then you start freaking out. Because like you said, there's a lot of factors that contribute towards fluctuations in your weight. Um, but again, let's, we have to all try not to tie our emotions to it. I know right now I'm prepping for a show and I have to provide all of this data to my coach. And even sometimes when I step the scale and I'm not seeing the drop I want to see, it kind of like bums me out. But then I remind myself that you're not going to always see drops, especially if your goal is weight loss, you're not always going to see drops every week. So it just, the benefits of having a coach is that keep you grounded. So your head is not up in the clouds thinking of what you need to do to keep that number down. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the menstrual cycle, um, specifically when it comes to diet. Should, should and how should your diet change when, around your menstrual cycle? Are there certain foods that may support that time period for us um, or anything that you recommend women to be consuming during that time? Well, let's talk about the menstrual cycle on like its phases. So we can talk about two main phases. So we have the follicular phase and the luteal phase. Yep. And generally, the luteal phase is more progesterone dominant and the follicular phase or the early phases from your day one or your day zero to your day 14 where you ovulate, yeah. that is the, peri the period where estrogen is going to be a dominant hormone. Yeah. So the difference between these two hormones is basically that when estrogen is dominant relatively to progesterone, you are more insulin sensitive and you have more energy, you have um, a little bit of a better balance when it comes to your, your, resistance, uh, your resistance, your endurance, yeah. everything that comes down to exercise and tolerance of volume. Yeah. Whereas when in the second half of the phase, there is generally a little bit of insulin resistance. It's not like you are type 2 diabetic, but it's it's more like less insulin sensitivity yeah. due to this hormone going up. And there is also a milieu of, of like a, a chain of responses from these hormones to be higher that are going to be more sensitive to stress. Yeah. And you're less tolerant to a, a, like high volumes of just anything that is going to trigger because your body wants to be in calm to sort of let your body get the egg when you have the ovulation, get the egg to eat, get implanted in, the, in your uterus and have the baby. So 
if that obviously doesn't happen because you you don't get pregnant after ovulating, that is when you pretty much get your cycle restarting again. Yeah. Okay. But what the difference? Just I am explaining this because this is when you see an e an, an increase in your body temperature. Yeah. Uh, after your ovulation and this sometimes triggers that additional cravings that yes. additional uh, need to eat more and this is pretty much a response of having a higher energy expenditure right and if you're eating in a deficit and probably not eating enough this is going to eat trigger even further those hunger pans or right. that need of wanting to eat more and if you're not eating enough or you don't have that flexible uh, approach to let to listen to your hunger cues uh, or, and like get adequate amount of food, you tend to like people and women generally tend to eat more yeah. and not, not their best foods potentially yeah. because they're going to crave the foods that are going to be higher in calories, mm -hmm. highly palatable. And that is like a survival mechanism for the body to get more calories when it yeah. needs, needs to. It doesn't necessarily mean like, if you're if you're not paying attention to that you might not still want something yeah because sometimes it just becomes a habit oh well I'm if i point. am closer to my period i am allowed to have cravings and am yeah. i allowed to binge yeah. so it is a lot of mindset a bit of a mindset game here as well i think it's very it's very tricky um for example i'm i'm not too i'm not too knowledgeable on this aspect of it but like uh, within my myself when I'm I'm on the pill so it's very different for me because I don't get those symptoms as much as like I've had girlfriends who are not on the, not on the pill and they they describe it as being very extreme levels of this like maybe it's just individualized but I wanted to see if you do have any information on that is it different when you are on something like a birth control or not is it the same type of concept for hormonally do you still go through those uh the same exact phases or uh, anything like that it's the same right or no no it is it is different because we see these different hormones going up and down yeah. in these different phases whereas when you're on the pill it's pretty much like a flat line yeah okay you don't really see uh interactions or increases in estrogen or progesterone yeah. but it's more like it makes you like a male yeah and hormonally so you don't really see those, uh, those responses that you will get from peaks of estrogen or peaks of uh, progesterone. Yeah, and a lot of times, you know, our general doctors don't necessarily go in depth about talking about these things for women who are, for, you know, on a birth control. So it's important to be able to assess if you are on birth control or not and be able to identify those phases, like specifically when you're not on birth control, identifying those phases. And like you said, sometimes we get into this mindset like, oh, I'm on my period, whatever, I'm not going to train, going to eat, whatever. There, there are certain things where, yes, allow your body to have these foods, nourish your body with the foods that it needs, right, during these time periods. But it's about creating balance and a healthy relationship with food through all phases, right? You're going to get stressed in life. It's not just when you're uh, in your menstrual cycle. You have to understand that you have to create these healthy relationships so you don't end up doing something like a binge, right? And it's not justifiable. You shouldn't be putting yourself in those positions because at the end of the day, you end up feeling many negative emotions on top of physical and mental emotions as well. So we don't want to encourage that. But of course, you can have the treats and stuff that you crave during that time period. You don't have to restrict yourself. But that's a give and take. You, can't, you, you don't have to restrict, but you also have to make sure that you're being mindful of how much you're consuming and allowing yourself to consume. I think mindful eating is really important yes. in this scenario. It's really paying attention to what you want and have a really thoughtful moment whether, well, ask yourself, yeah. are you hungry? Are you, what, what do you want? And if you want that, do you think is that something that aligns with your goals. Yeah. If you had it, is it, is it okay? Are you going to feel good after? Because it's not about just eating it. It's how are you going to feel about eating it? Yeah. And later on, are you going to feel regret? Or is it still aligned if you still had a little bit of that? Yeah. Uh, or if you start eating it, are you going to let yourself continue to eat? Yeah. And how are you going to feel about it? So it's like, I think internal self-reflection yes, is really valuable and it, 
it's, it's just a, a game changer when you actually bring those skills into your daily day-to-day -day diet because it allows you to understand your needs, how you feel, what you want, and how can you negotiate in order to be happy about your decisions yeah. and make sure and knowing that it's your choice, you're yeah. in power, not the other way around. So the yeah. diet is not controlling you, but you are in control of your exactly. diet. Exactly. And I think that, you know, we get so tied to food, right? Because we all have to do it. We all have to eat in order to survive. And we all know, we have the uh, responsibility and power, the authority, like we put the food in our mouth, right? Nobody's forcing you to eat something. So it's like being able to be mindful of those decisions because when it comes to, you know, when I was younger, I had a period of time when I was very disordered with my eating and tied so many emotions to it. I didn't know how to stop and then I would feel guilty. And those are the type of things that women of all ages go through and not just women, men go through this as well. But it's being able to take a minute of like self-reflection in, in that moment, right? I think that's one thing that really helped me and is what I recommend for some of my female clients that do struggle with that is in those moments to take a step back and self-reflect, right? Because at the end of yep. the day, if you're just mindlessly doing these things, you'll end up getting to do it, right? It goes by really, really fast, feels really good. And then afterwards you hit that point of like, it's hitting you hard mentally and you're not enjoying how you're feeling physically, but also mentally, or, or you try to fix it the next day. You shouldn't be trying to fix it the next day by doing extra work or eating less. That's one thing I also wanted to touch on with you is, you know, how do you navigate going through those periods when you are over consuming? How do you, what do you do the next day? Right? It's, I, I, it, no extra cardio guys, no extra cardio. That is the wrong answer. Red flag, red flag, red flag. But I'll give the to you to expand a little bit more about that. My approach is what are your goals and how, how are you in terms of your timing? Like per, for example, you're getting ready for a show. Yeah. Like you, there's not much room to wiggle or to play with. And if you do go over your calories, you have to somehow start negotiating whether is it okay if I do certain adjustments so I, at the end of the week, I'm still compliant. Yes. But you have a specific time frame you have to stick to. Yes. The difference with a lifestyle client is that you don't have that deadline. Yeah. And there is no need, especially if there are other things that you have to play with, which is your behaviors, lifestyle changes in a sustainable long-term way. Yeah your mindset as well towards food, your relationship with food. So it, it is really important to assess where you're at and how important it is for you to achieve your goals to a certain degree in a certain period of time. And I guess it is tricky sometimes when you have clients working with you with a, in a like 12 weeks or 24 week program where they want to see changes within that period of time. Yeah. And if they weren't compliant or they went over the calories, how they can still manage to get some results within this time frame. But that doesn't mean you have to uh, take a very drastic approach yes. to sort of compensate. You might be able to do sort certain adjustments that may yeah. put you in a better position um, but might not necessarily offset the full amount of calories you over eight. Yeah. But it might just make it less Impact. bad. Yeah. Impact less. Yeah. yeah. And so that would be my approach. And I guess it's, it's just looking at, well, what are some of the things we could potentially do? Are you able or are you happy to perhaps increase your daily steps to yeah. by 2000 steps more every day? Yeah. Or are you, are you, do you have the capacity uh, or like the amount of calories to sort of adjust them a little bit more so you can make tomorrow or the next few days lower calorie days so it pretty much levels out by the end of the week yeah. so it is like that analysis of what are your options yeah. and what is still healthy within yeah. the context of your situation yeah i think when it comes to your um, nutrition it's not just a snapshot of the day it's your weekly average and people think one bad day ruins it and that's it but when you do that type of mentality you're going to have one bad day which leads to another and another and another so if you completely stop eating the next day you're going to get really hungry and then want to repeat and do that again so like you said it's really important to 
whether you're doing this with for yourself or with a client um, to assess, you know, where your calorie standpoint is, what your time frame for your yeah. goal is, just no need to do anything drastic because usually drastic approaches lead to like really drastic measures in terms of the response of your body, such as re repetitive behaviors that are not uh, positive, such as overeating, yeah. binging and stuff like that. Um, for our last question, are there any foods that can help optimize overall hormonal health for women we're talking about nutrient dense foods that women can prioritize for their health and be mindful of consumption i think overall it is all foods are important yeah. somehow each food group has a specific micronutrients um, and minerals and vitamins that will have a specific role overall we want to prioritize adequate amount of uh, nutrient dense protein sources that not just contain protein but they are very rich in vitamin b12 and folate magnesium zinc also omega-3 fatty acids from fatty fish or perhaps coming from 